Copan Monastery it was started by two great lamas here in Nepal, uh, Lama Tupen Yeshi and Lama Soba Rinpoche. And they came out of Tibet, you know, way back in 1959 as refugees. And, uh, but one of the lamas, Lama Sopa, is actually from Sulukumbu in Nepal. So they spent something like eight years in a refugee camp in India. And then at the end of eight years, uh, they met Westerners traveling in India at that time, in the maybe 1965 or something like that. And uh, they started to ask them about meditation and to teach them meditation. And uh, that's how the connection with Westerners started. And then gradually they went to see His Holiness Dalai Lama and he advised them to come here to Nepal. And then because Rinpoche is from Nepal, and he sort of returned to Nepal after, after many years in Tibet and the refugee camp, I think he left his home when he was only uh, maybe seven or eight years old. And, uh, but it happened so that in his previous life, you know, he had been a great yogi in Sulukumbu called Laudo Lama. And um, in that life, the um, people uh, in his village asked him to start a school for their children. But he felt old, you know, he was in his 70s maybe or something like that. He felt too old to really start something that needed a lot of energy. So uh, he made a promise to his um, uh, neighbors that he would um, come back in next life and start the school. <laughs> so then, when he was in his twenties, you know, uh, in the next life, he returned to Nepal, went back to his village and said, let's start the school. And then he started a monastery up in Sulukumbu, built a little gompa, and about 30 little monks came to study there and to be monks. And they spent about two hard winters up in Sulukumbu and realized it's, it wasn't practical to have a school there. So they moved it down to Kopan. From there it grew from 30 to now 350 monks and now even 350 nuns, many of them from Tibet. And um, so the main activities here, that's the school for the monks and nuns, for the local monks and nuns who come from Tibetan families. And also a study and retreat center for Westerners from all over the world. So this is just coexisting here somehow and we're benefiting each other, I think, this way. FPMT is, um, is teaching, you know, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition worldwide. And uh, also uh, we are uh, establishing centers worldwide to um, teach uh, especially the Tibetan Mahayana tradition uh, in the different centers. Mm. And um, in this way, preserving the Dharma, I mean the foundation, FPMT means the foundation for the preservation of the Mahayana tradition. And we try to um, create harmonious environments for people to come and take teachings. Uh, we think to develop their wisdom and compassion, you know, with uh, always with an altruistic intention to develop a good heart and a sense of responsibility. Well, actually, when you look at the shape of a stupa, 
It almost has the shape of a Buddha with a crown protrusion, you know, the crown, and then comes the, the, the eyes in the four directions, that's like the face. So a Buddha is always aware in the you know, four directions and uh, signifying the omniscient mind in the four directions. And then you get the bulbing part that is sort of like the torso, and then you get the steps up that's like the full lotus posture. And um, so it looks a little bit like the form of a Buddha, but the main significance of stupa is actually the Buddha's mind. It signifies the Buddha's mind, and the step signifies the steps on the path to enlightenment. And then usually the, the stupa contains uh, what we call holy objects or relics from a Buddha or a holy being. And um, so in one sense it's a reliquary for that, containing the relics. And being an object for people to create merits, you know, circumambulating, making offerings, doing prostrations. And uh, so it's a focal point, I think, for people, you know, to do simple Dharma practice. Because, um, you know, Dharma practice can be very profound and meditation can be very profound. Uh, but sometimes not everybody has the time to study or go very deeply into these things. Then Dharma, I would say, is um, any inner method that helps us overcome our grasping, attachment, clinging attitude and mind, and our hatred and anger, and our close-mindedness and our ignorance. These three we call the three poisonous mind, because it might, makes our mind restless, unhappy, and dissatisfied whenever they arise in the mind. They sort of afflict our mind. And um, it doesn't mean that we are our anger, we are our attachment, we are our ignorance, but we have these um, obscurations in the mind. And Dharma is the method to remove them, or at least to reduce them, you know, to a level where we can live with them, but they don't disturb our mind. So it's all inner methods. And um, the, uh, the Buddha Dharma is all about training the mind. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's like mental education, actually, to practice Dharma, to develop the mind. The students that come here, why they have such instant uh, benefit is that we actually know, we understand that these states of mind are not good for us, but usually we don't know how to work with them, or how to reduce them, or how to overcome them. But that's the beauty in the Buddhist tradition. There are so many methods. There's no shortage of methods. There's so many, many methods to help us develop our mind and to really bring about uh, the development of our human potential. Now that is the meaning of Dharma, so to develop our wisdom and compassion. Yeah.